Hello guys, sorry about that technical glitch there. Um, we're the right way up now, so happy days. So once again, welcome back to Upper Reach and to our final live stream wine tasting. Um, just a huge thank you to you all for supporting us during this really crazy time. And we're just so glad that you can be with us, tasting the wines, enjoying yourselves from the comfort of your own home. Um, now today I'm going to be talking about what I think is one of the most underappreciated and underrated styles of wine. So we're going to be talking about fortified wine today. Um, now if you guys are local to Perth, you are near an absolute treasure trove of beautiful fortified wines that you can get your hands on. Um, Today, what we're going to really talk about, I will go through a little bit of a background about fortified wines across the world and how it's made. Um, we're then also going to be talking to Laura about what is so special about Swan Valley fortified wines and how did they become just so famous, so, so often drunk and just as delicious as they are. So that'll be really good fun to have a chat with her about. Um, so we're going to be splitting it again like I always do, so in three parts, so the background, we're then going to move on to the tasting section where I'm going to be tasting our, well, our non-vintage wine, so we're going to be starting off with our tawny and then we're going to be tasting our musket as well. So we've got a lot of really great little drops in store, like, so I hope you're sitting back, you're really comfortable, you've got a nice glass of fortified in your hand. Um, because, yeah, and it'll be really good fun. You can leave your questions and uh, questions until the end. I always love hearing from everyone. Um, and you can really try and test me. Um, yeah, fortified wines. I didn't really have too much of a knowledge about until I started working here in the Swan Valley. Um, and then being so lucky to be around such great quality wines, um, I really started to gain that knowledge and appreciation for them. Um, so I will start us off um, quickly by just, yeah, let's get started anyway. So to begin with, as all good things are, fortified wine started off as an accident. Now, pretty much back in the day, this is like the sort of 1700s, even dating back to sort of back in the Roman times when wine was first some, being something to be quite sought after and people were wanting it shipped all around the world or taken in, on long voyages and over big swathes of land. Um, the problem was um, it would oxidize. So they didn't have the containment methods that we have at the moment. So they would just carry them around in their um, oak barrels or they'd carry them around in uh, big wine skins, stuff like that. And what would happen is they would basically have turned to vinegar before they actually arrived at their destination. Um, so winemakers had this dilemma, they were like, okay, we've got this huge market here that we really want to sell our wines to, but we can't get it there without it spoiling. So they decided to add a grape spirit to it. So they added a brandy, and what that did was it fortified the alcohol content, which acted as a, a really nice little what's the word, just an antioxidant to stop the wines from spoiling. And this changed the flavor profile of the wines. Another thing that they would also do is actually make the wines a little bit sweeter too, just to make sure that they didn't spoil. Now, this style of wine actually became quite popular. So actually having fortified wines higher in alcohol content and also a little bit sweeter and a little bit more sticky as well. Now, this popularity was really captured by wines that were being made in uh, the Porto region of Portugal, um, hence why we are not allowed to say that this is a port anymore. Um, they have a name thing just like Champagne does. Um, and pretty much, Porto used to make these, well, they still do, this, they're pretty much the best place in the world to get the nice vintage styles of port that have been aged. Um, and you can age them in the bottle as well, which is amazing. Um, so Porto and Madeira, also different styles like Sherry as well, have also been brought forward into production too. Um, and yeah, basically, 
We really look to those regions for inspiration in how to age our wines here as well, um, but also that really set the standard on how great fortified wines can be and their ageability as well. Now, when they started to make their wines, they would actually let the grapes raisin on the vine. So what would happen is evaporation would take place. So, well, the grapes would dry out basically. Um, and sugars would concentrate. So you're basically pressing raisins to get the juice out of them. And obviously that means there's a lot more sugar in them. Now, when you're, forti well, when you're fermenting these grapes, pretty much the yeast can only really survive in, a, in an alcoholic solution of between 15 and 18% before it actually starts to die and turn into uh, what are they called? Le yeast leaves. Um, and the problem with this was you had a lot of residual sugar in the wines, but then you've got that beautiful sweetness and that syrupy character that you get there. So, after you have done this initial for, uh, fermentation, you then fortify it with a brandy. You can add the fortification, you can add the brandy in beforehand, uh, before fermentation, but generally it's a stylistic kind of thing. Um, with, yeah, pretty much with the fortification as well, you really need to use a really high quality brandy for the best outcomes of your fortified wines as well. Now, Another thing that is essential in fortified production as well is its aging. Now, the yields of fortified wines, each, well, every vintage is very, very low because you're basically pressing raisins to try and get juice out. And it's very, very tough to press them. There's barely any juice that comes out and you've got to use what you have. Um, so generally quite a traditional way of making fortifieds and aging them um, is called the Solera system. Now, the Solera system is really great for creating consistency in your vintages, well, not even in vintages, in your product, um, because it's very difficult to explain without a diagram. So I've drawn one here for you. So if you can see here, these are all barrels. Now the top barrels are the newest, are the newest pressings of juice that have been for, uh, fermented. So they are then added to older barrels, which are then added to older barrels. So this is the oldest fortified wine down here at the bottom, but it's then blended with the younger one. So all of these younger wines get into this bottom barrel and that is what is put into the bottle. So it's a common misconception that you can keep fortified wines for years and you can age them, but really you can only do that with vintage port because that's more of a wine rather than a sticky wine. So with this system, when you buy a fortified wine that's been in Solera system, the winemaker is keeping an eye on it. He is making sure that it is a perfect quality, the great blend, good balance, um, and he's bottling perfection so that he can give it to you. So when you come out and you buy fortified wine, it is ready to be drunk. You don't have to keep it for a few years. You literally just get tucked in. It's a beautiful little drop. Now, I think we should move on to a little bit something closer to home. So Laura is now going to mention for us some great, just fun facts and fun stories that you've heard about fortified wine here in Swan Valley. So yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, I feel very lucky to live here in the Swan Valley and one of the really amazing things I think about the, the Swan Valley is how good the fortified wines are. Um, and it's, it's almost a shame that we don't drink them more than we do. Um, and I guess uh, traditionally the Swan Valley has been a very much a fortified wine producing area. Um, it's really the Swan Valley and Brother Glen in um, Australia that are the main sort of fortified areas. And that's mainly because our climate is so... Um, great for getting our grapes really ripe um, and so that we can get these lovely rich um, grapes. We can get them sweet enough so that we can then make fortified wines. Um, up to about the 60s, um, that was really the bulk of what everybody was drinking in Australia, but uh, in Britain as well. And that sort of reflects, I guess, the heritage of um, Australia, that it was kind of colonized by the British and they tended to be more interested in drinking fortified wines, they weren't, didn't really have a, a massive table wine drinking culture, um, you know, and 
we're saying fortifiers, but we also would in, I'd include sherry, I think, in yeah. that as well. Um, so that's sort of what people were drinking. So as I say, up to about the 60s, um, it was 90% of what people were drinking were fortified. And that's why the Swan Valley used to make a lot of fortified fat and that the region was so good for it. Um, I guess the fortifieds in the Swan Valley, as I said, are completely world class. We've got those um, hereditary, uh, not hereditary, sorry, those areas in the old world that um, Stephen was talking about, like uh, in Portugal um, and in the south of Spain, in Jerez, where in fact half my family are from. Um, and um, they've been making sherry or port in those places, but certainly the Swan Valley uh, is completely world class. Um, I was just doing a little bit of thinking around this before we started, um, and um, I guess. One of the great examples of this is Jack Mann. Um, uh, he worked for Hortons. He did, I think, 52 vintages consecutively for Hortons um, quite a while ago now. Um, but he uh, made a, um, a fortified that he took to the Melbourne show. And that was the most important in those days. This was um, in the 60s. That was the most important wine show in Australia. And he said, and he won. Uh, um, 12 times, 12 years running, um, the best fortified at Melbourne show. Um, but he was, I was talking to his granddaughter Anthea and she said, oh, I remember Jack telling me, you know, the best thing about winning, obviously everyone likes winning, but the really great thing was he said it was always good to beat those people from Rutherglen. You know, and there's always <laughs> been a very sort of friendly um, competition, um, rivalry, I think, between the Swan Valley and from Rutherglen because it is such a specialised area, uh, these sort of fortifieds. Um, the other... Um, uh, amazing thing that I found out when I was looking up this is that the first Swan Valley Wine Show was actually in uh, 1986. Yep, uh, sorry, a lie. Nin yeah, no, that's right, 1986. And um, I was looking at the results, and Taliansic won um, the trophy and the gold medal for the best fortified with their. Uh, 1961 liqueur musket. Um, they'd only just released that about, oh, they released it after 25 years, so uh, about three years before. Yeah, that's right. Um, so they'd released it um, three years before and it had done really well nationally. Um, then it won that uh, trophy for the best fortified at the Swan Valley show in 89. Uh, and it's actually, it's Paul Murray who wrote the article. Um, so he's still, you know, involved in the wine show all these years on. Um, but then it went on to come runner-up for second top fortified in the International Wine Show in London in 1986. So this is a wine that I guess has kept giving to the Swan Valley, um, but has done so well. So it just shows you that, you know, they're great wines. Um, the other amazing thing I think about those days, and this was something that was fun for me to find out when I first moved to the Swan Valley, was how important those fortified wines were to the winemakers. So they would make fortified, and this is post-60s, this is in the, still in the 80s, they'd be still making fortified, they'd be making table wines, and that was becoming more uh, increasingly important, sort of proportion of their production and their sales, but they would all run, and, and this was Durham man telling me, and, and John Kozovich, so these are, you know, not... Yeah. yeah, that's right, well-renowned winemakers. But when the um, wine show would open at, uh, in Perth, so the Perth wine show, they open the doors and you can go in and see what prizes, or get your results. Um, but they would all um, rush to see who'd won the sherry prize because that was the trophy to win. That was the prize to win. And you know, I think it was Mary Kozovic telling me this. She said, yeah, we'd all rush over to see it. It was like, yay, who's got the best sherry? So um, <laughs> it just shows you how different things are. I mean, that was only in, I think, the early 80s, you know, and, and before that. Um, and whatever people were drinking, it was really who could make the best sherry. And sadly, I don't think we drink very much sherry anymore. Um, so yeah, so I guess that sort of just um, uh, places the Swan Valley in context now uh, yeah. with the international I was just thing. mentioning to the guys as well, just it is such a treasure trove, so close to the city as well. Like, I mean, there are so many incredible fortifieds that you can find out here and they're so just thick, they're syrupy, they're just delightful. And there's lots of fun ways you can use um, fortifieds as well. Um, uh, but. Um, I think in cook I think it's really you can get into the habit of having a bottle of fortified open all the time because it doesn't go off you know it's 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 fortified with the spirit um, so that's going to keep it fresh so it's just going to last and last and last and it's fantastic for cooking but we've got a few tips around that a bit later on um, well, I was going to talk a little bit maybe about how we made these wines do you want to do that I think that's marvelous I'll yeah. pour these and yeah. you can mention how Brilliant. we make these lovely okay. little drops. <laughs> 
So, um, we're new on the scene. We've only been here uh, about 22, 23 years or something. Um, uh, but it uh, wasn't the first year, but after a couple of years, we did start to make um, some fortified wines. Um, and we're going to start by looking at the tawny. So, as Stephen said, we're not allowed to call it tawny port, um, but colloquially, that is you know, how people sometimes think of these things. And it was really interesting when people had to change that name. What were we going to call um, uh, this wine in Australia? Because we're no longer allowed to use, you know, port because it has to be made from Portugal. And in the end, uh, they decided on colour. Um, so if you look at these wines now against a white background, you can see that this is a, a tawny colour, and that is why it's called tawny. Um, the other colour you could choose, or name, non name you could choose, would be ruby, and that's if it's a bit redder. Um, so it's really just based on the colour. And I remember when Derek and I first made it, we were like, oh, what do we call it? We're looking against, do you think that's more tawny, or do you think that's more ruby? So we decided <laughs> tawny. Um, a beautiful golden colour to it as well, just gold and that tawny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So our tawny is made from um, red wine grapes, mostly Shiraz. Um, it, it can change a little bit every year, there's a bit of fluidity in the process, just depends on the season and, and what's happening. Um, but it's pr primarily Shiraz. Um, Derek will let them ripen on the vine a lot longer, so they get a lot richer, uh, sorry, a lot sweeter, richer flavours, but also a lot more sugar in those grapes. Um, then he starts the fermentation as he would normally, you know, presses them, starts the fermentation as he would normally. Um, but um, he'll actually add um, some spirit, and he doesn't use brandy spirit, interestingly. He uses SVR. Now, I forgot to check exactly what that stands for, but basically what it is, is it's a really, really um, uh, pure alcohol, um, probably some ethanol, really. It's about 98% alcohol and it has no taste. It's a neutral spirit, so it gives it no taste, no flavour. Because we think that our Shiraz fruit that goes into this tawny is so lovely, it doesn't need anything extra. Um, and that's where you're talking about having that really great brandy spirit. Well, that might be important elsewhere, but certainly at Upper Reach, we like to use just a really neutral spirit. Um, what that does is it stops that fermentation, so that you, um, those grapes have still got all the, the, the juice, the wine now, it's still got that lovely sweetness from the fruit, but it's got enough alcohol. It's had some fermentation, but it's also had that um, uh, spirit added to it. So that's why hence the name fortifies, because yeah. you fortified them with spirit. You know, so. two and a half years nearly I've been working here, and there we go. I, I now know it's not with brandy, so <laughs> <laughs> always learning. Fantastic. So have a little look at this. And I mean, that's the most best thing I think about fortifiers. I'm not sure that's a, a great uh, <laughs> line to say, not very grammatical, <laughs> but just the smell. I mean, really, I mean, the I even say to people in the cellar door, um, you almost don't have to taste them because they smell so amazing. They've just got such a great nose um, that you could just sort of smell them and you really have a, a real sense of what they taste like. Um, I guess if you, I've never really thought about it, but if you're sort of starting with your wine tasting, you know, down that journey, in yeah. some ways you could almost start by just smelling fortifieds and thinking about them because it's so intense, yet yeah, everyone's yeah. got something they can relate. So hopefully you've got a glass of fortified, obviously ideally ours, but if not, mm -hmm. something in front of you, just that so you can even smell it if you're not going to drink it. Exactly. So let's have a little look at this. Mm. Yeah, I'm not going to spit because I live here, so I don't have to drive anywhere drive. tonight. <laughs> and it makes me sad every week. <laughs> yeah, but that's lovely. It's so toasty. Wow. You really get that it's been in oak for quite a long time. And that just those dried fruit characters, those beautiful, like, like dried sultanas mm. and lots of, yeah, it, it's set. I get, I get a lot of toffee on this one as well. Um, and that's that like sort of caramel, caramel yeah, caramel, toffee. That kind yeah, of that's right. It's so lovely. And I lo what I like about this is there's a little bit of oranginess as well. That's an yeah, orange like that. marmalade. Yeah, mm. that orange peel. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And that kind of crisp, clean finish you get with the tawny, which I just think, um, you know, it's nice. Oh, what's the weather today? It's, it's beautiful. I don't know whether it's spring or autumn or what it is, but um, or winter. But, you know, you can drink this any time of the year because it's yeah. not too rich, it's not too cloying, um, it's just got that lovely um, clean finish. So I think that the tawny is looking fantastic. So. Well, saying that you can have it any time of the year, I did have a little bit of a phase where a couple of blocks of ice and a little squeeze of lime and that was a beautiful summer drink. <laughs> they all 
killed me for it. Yeah, but we could handle just, it. I loved it. I thought it was delicious. It just cut through the sweetness. It was beautiful. And really Derek was like, well. oh my God, don't tell me that. Please don't tell me that. He says that in the door. We're like, oh no, he doesn't say that in the door. But he was. I and some do. days yeah. he'd even have the limes there and he'd be like, here, there's no one around. Quick, exactly. draw it like this. Don't tell the winemaker. <laughs> So there right. you go. Well, that, that's how we get our friends here. Exactly. <laughs> so now we look at the musket. So this is made quite differently than the cure musket. It's made from, I always think, attractively named grape variety called brown musket. Um, it's brown. Um, and so unlike the tawny, um, you can, we make that from Shiraz, but it can have other red grapes in as well. Musket is made from musket varietal. So Stephen's going to show you the, uh, the, the colour. Now, so it's there. quite a bit darker now than the tawny. Much more viscous, much deeper in colour as well. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, and this is where you need smell addition. Um, but yeah, so making the musket, that was, um, that was, that's always a bit of fun. Um, we started making this a long time ago. So we've been here about 23 years, so probably about 18, yeah, yeah 18 years ago. And um, of course, we had to plant the vines to start with and get the grapes growing. So, you know, I think we talked about this before, about five years before you can really get any decent quantity of grapes. You don't need a heap because you don't tend to make masses and masses of musket. So we picked it. Um, and as Stephen was saying, just trying to press it was really difficult because there's so little juice in them because we let them raisin on the vine. So, um, you know, when you buy raisins, those sort of fancy ones for your cheese board that have still got the um, uh, stems attached? They didn't look quite as dried as that, but getting that way. Yeah. So you've got a lot less juice. You've left them on the vine longer, so the sun has made them shrivel and, as you said, raisined up. Um, then we picked them, so obviously all hand-picked, and then we would try and press them, but it was such a small quantity, and our press is not massive, but it was, you know, it was still not very much in there. Struggle. It was really hard <laughs> to get the juice out of them. And in the end, um, you know, some of the older, you know, winemakers here said, you know, what we use is a mincer. So they actually mince the... Um, <laughs> Um, the raisins to get the juice out and we don't get lots and like Stephen was showing you it's terribly viscous it's really sticky stuff um, and so it doesn't flow very easily so often we will actually just gravity feed we don't even use a lot of pumps and hoses and stuff because you just lose so much of that um, really precious uh, musket juice um, through the hoses through the pumps that we try and just gravity feed it all um, and I think like just with working out in the vineyard and stuff like that and tasting the odd grape like the musket grapes, even when they're just before this raisining thing, I think they're the tastiest in the vineyard. They've just got this rose water and lychee kind of flavour to them. And I agree. Smell it yeah, away totally. In and I actually reckon that, because I think when you buy table grapes, uh, because next year obviously you'll be coming out to the valley to buy the table grapes, but when you come out here to the valley, it's great talking to the um, grape growers, the professionals, and you know, they're different varieties, obviously ripen at different times. But uh, I'm with Stephen, these are my favourite table grapes as well, the muskets and the muscatels. So this is a really rich, it's a lot richer on the nose, I think, than the tawny. Um, it's really very pretty, very perfumed, almost like you're saying, sort of rose petal or that Turkish floral, delight. Just, mm. just um, definitely that rose water comes through a little bit for me. But the main thing is that are those real, just lush, dried, brandy fruits. Mm. They're just, I know it's overly said, it is said too much, but Christmas in a bottle, it really, really is. Oh, and definitely. Just, and then that lovely buzz that you get in your mouth after tasting it. You know, that's sort of another of my favourite parts of this. Um, because it is, it's just sort of the gift that keeps giving. It just goes on and on. And it's such a lovely, long, rich flavour. Just smooth as silk as well. Yeah, absolutely. It really is velvety. Absolutely. Um, we, and again, this one is fortified. So it's made in that same way we're talking about. So we uh, ferment the fruit. We, we um, mince the fruit and then we get it fermenting and then we'll stop that fermentation with that very plain um, so it's the same neutral, one as well, yeah, huh? yeah, ah. yeah, spirit. Right. And then we put it in, it's a modified version of the Solera system um, that we use, but we do, we will um, uh, take out the wine that we're going to bottle this year and then we will put the new stuff into those barrels so it will get mixed up. So every bottle that you drink will have some of the... Um, well, these ones fruit in, yeah. yeah some of the fruit in it will be uh, 18 or some of the yeah. wine in it will be 18 year old so you sort of mix it all up and that's um, um, yeah that's the way we like it yeah. so yeah 
Yeah, it's fantastic. amazing and just so tasty. I mean, you guys must be enjoying this at home as well. Just yeah, perfect four o'clock on a Saturday. You know, what else do you want to do? That's, that's exactly right. Uh, yeah. I had a couple of things that I was going to talk about just quickly about cooking with um, these sorts of wines. And I, I was saying, as they do last, it's great to have them open. Um, and there's a couple of things, you know, obviously there's using them in desserts. And I do like to um, make well, I call them puddings. Um, I really like making puddings, so there's always room for a little bit of, you know, one or other liqueurs in, in those. Um, and then, of course, you have Christmas puddings and Christmas cake and mince pies and all that sort of Christmas fare um, is fantastic with that. But, of course, for us in Australia, winter is more appropriate to use some of these beautiful flavours like in puddings and stuff. But there's a couple of other things. Um, and again, this is Anthea's tip. She's a fantastic chef. Um, she was saying a little splash of liqueur muscat in... Um, um, like a red wine reduction, you know, if you're making a sort of stock or a jus or, you know, in the base of a, a, a casserole or a pie, something like that. So it just makes it sing. You won't be able to necessarily taste it, but it really just gives it such a lot of beautiful flavour. And just to get in the habit of having maybe um, a, a bottle of liqueur open that you just use for cooking and, you know, if you have a little bit yourself, well, that's not a bad thing. Um, it happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, everyone likes to have a bit of fun. Um, and then the other thing that um, she suggested, which I thought was absolutely gold and never crossed my mind, but it seems so obvious, to make an affogato out of it. Oh, yes. You know, just something really simple, really different, but yeah, just a lovely. Just really makes it all work. And then going to food pairings as well. Obviously the desserts like your creme brulees, your panna cottas, they are amazing with it, but also because it's so sweet, it complements really salty and buttery things like cheese. Yeah. So amazing with a cheese board. It honestly like, yeah, if I'm having a cheese board, I just need like a little nip of it just to take that cloying saltiness yeah, away. Yeah. And it just, it really makes the flavors explode. There's that scene in Ratatouille where he mixes the fruit and the cheese and everything just explodes. So it's the same kind of thing with Fortified, and you get the buzz. So. Yeah, and they are stunning wines, and I think the other really nice thing for me about them is you don't need much. Like I was saying, they're such rich flavours, they're so luscious, and then you do get that sort of... Um, so aftertaste. Yeah, that's right, around. it just lasts and lasts. So, yeah, no, they're fantastic little treat. They are gorgeous. I, love them. Have a look at the... I will have a little look at the questions. So I'll read a couple out to you, Laura. Fantastic. Oh, Let's this see is what everyone's been bit, saying. Yes. You get a taste of your own medicine. <laughs> Alrighty, let's, oh God, this is difficult. Here we go. Yeah, that's right. The Happy other accident. of my favorite uses of this, and I think this use is gonna be particularly appropriate. Um, it's still not tax deductible though. Uh, the tawny particularly is probably the very best cough mixture that you can ever buy. You yes. know, if you've got that dry cough, um, it's quite going to be quite embarrassing this winter where people look at you, you know, with your <laughs> cough. Um, the tawny will be perfect. And just a little nip of that each evening. I'm sure that will pretty much fix most of our coughs. Oh, that's very kind of you, Eli. They say, thank you so much for the series. They've really enjoyed it. Oh, so brilliant. it's very kind. Yeah, oh. we've had a terrible time doing it, I as know. you can see. And, Kate, <laughs> and Casey agrees as well from Travelling Corkscrew. It's very kind. Really love doing them, they're such good fun. Um, and yes, here we go. Bought Tawny yesterday, ready to go. Well, I think we've, ah, here we are. Erna has very kindly told us what S SVR is. Oh, thank you. It Erna. is um, ethyl alcohol. So it's yeah. a neutral grape alcohol, but you call it spiritus vini rect, oh. Rectifarcus. Ah, <laughs> well, there you go. That's the bit I didn't I mean, look up exactly what the SVR is. But yeah, thanks, Erna. And I have to say, Erna has been an absolute star. She tried to buy her wines for this tasting oh, a couple of weeks ago. And we uh, sent them out because I took them to the post office. And they only just made it to Mora yesterday, yesterday Friday. Um, it was about three weeks. It's insane. So well so, done for your patience, yeah, Erna. And thank you, you so much. Alrighty, let's have a gander. I think Australia Post Ooh. is struggling a bit at the moment. Yeah. Also, Kim is asking, could you place them in the fridge? Uh, uh, not in winter. <laughs> yes. I, I really think the tawny is suitable for it, but not so much the musket. But that's my opinion. Yeah, and look, I would... I agree with everyone. Um, <laughs> I would put them maybe in the fridge to take the heat off them in summer. I wouldn't put them near the fridge now. There's just no need. Because you don't want them cold. Um, now, having said that, in summer on a 35 or 40 degree day, you don't want that hot alcohol because you will spoil them. So you really want to drink them like a classic sort of red wine temperature. So, you know, 
but maybe a little warmer. So red wine you might drink at 18. I think these wines, again, if they're 18 degrees. So if it's a hot day, you've stored them somewhere warm. And that can happen with fortifiers because they do last for so long. And if you're anything like me, sometimes you forget that you've got them and you're like, oh, brilliant idea. <laughs> um, and then you go and get them. Yeah, pop them in the fridge, but just for, you know, 10 uh, minutes, just to take yeah. the heat off them. Normally do about 10, 15 minutes yeah. in the you fridge. You don't want them cold. Yeah. You might miss some of those flavours. We've got a nice flavour note here. We've got salted caramel. Yeah, I definitely get yeah, that. Yeah. Very, very nice. I'll just check. And we've got the... Um, <laughs> Lucky thing. Um, any suggestions for food pairing? So we've got the chocolate being obvious choice. Um, savory and salty, definitely those cheese boards. Like, I honestly think they make them. Well, I, um, I, as I said, I'm a bit of a pudding maker and sadly eater. Well, yeah. Um, sticky date pudding is just delicious with this. Oh, um, yes. Anything eggy and custardy, so creme caramel or um, even just custard. Um, any of those sort of rich... Um, creamy, eggy sorts of flavours. I think I love this. And also, um, uh, a couple of days ago, I did an orange almond cake, and that was really nice with it because you've got that nuttiness and the citrus as well. So it, I guess it's those for me. It's those creamy, sort of custardy, eggy flavours, but then also citrus as well. But you need something rich. Um, Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the other classic sense. one would yeah. be ice cream, of course. Um, and that's that what, is. Yeah, that's your summer. I always um, think it's dessert. criminal, but I mean, I've still not tried that. I, yeah, I, need, I need to give it a go. I, I'm happy with my ice cream in a bowl and my muscat in a glass, but really to mix them up, yeah, no, it seems yeah. a bit of a shame. That's what I thought. But um, yeah, I think we've covered Test everything rather, rather well. But, um, well, hopefully. <laughs> I know, we cross our fingers anyway. Right. But, so thank yeah. you guys so much for um, watching these and doing them with us, because um, uh, we have really enjoyed them, but it's been nice, I think, um, especially in those beginning weeks where it was all pretty ghastly, um, you know, and the things kept shutting down and you didn't really, couldn't, there was no end in sight. Um, and I think uh, at the moment we're going to, this is going to be the last one for now, um, because we're hoping that WA is moving forward and next week uh, restaurants will be open, albeit on a, a smaller scale. Um, and we're going to start playing with the new normal. Um, I'm not quite sure yet that what that will look like, and I think that we're going to find for everyone that we change one way and then we go back and then we change again. Um, but it's going to be good, good yeah. fun, and I think it's you know it's exciting. You know, changes it has to happen, so um, that's what's going to happen. I know with Cellar Door next week we're not allowed to do tasting still. Um, we've still got to do, in fact, we've still got to do social distancing um, <laughs> and. Um, uh, so we'll be having to be careful how we manage doing tastings when we're allowed to do them. Um, you know, they'll probably have to be a bit shorter and a bit more space between people. But, the, you know, I think with a bit of give and take that we can make everything work. And I think what's been, I really, I don't know if you can say I've enjoyed about this whole, you know, disaster, covid -y crisis thing. But what I've found has been really lovely is that I think most people have come together through this in some ways. Oh, and yeah, yeah, people have been kinder to each other. And I think if we, because partly I think because we're not rushing, we just haven't got so much on. Um, and I think that's been really lovely. So I'm hoping that we can continue to work with that. And I know that we're all going to have to come and be patient with restaurants, I think, for the next oh. few weeks, because they really, yeah, I, 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 I take my hat off to them, those guys that are going to open and just do the 20, because it's going to be very challenging for them to manage it all. Speaking of which, Riverbrook Restaurant will be open from Monday onwards, so definitely get your bookings yeah. in because we really want to see you again. Um, the Vineyard Walk Trail as well, please come out and have a nice little walk and a change of scenery. Um, it's always lovely to have a little catch up with you guys as well. Um, but yeah, Fantastic. I think thank you so much for joining yeah. us on this series. And I hope that you guys yeah. continue to enjoy your uh, fortifieds for the rest of the evening or at least part of the evening. So we've just got you started now. Exactly. Um, so yeah, and look if there's any other things that you do want to know about, let us know, because we don't have to do them live, um, and we can still record them and, and send them out to you, so yeah, fantastic, thank you very much, and thank, thank you, you so Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much guys, we'll see you very very soon at the winery, okay? Uh -huh. Stay safe, happy hat washing. Enjoy your weekend, <laughs> we'll see you soon.